welcome everyone to another episode of Elbows Tight Podcast. It's your host, Travis. Today, I have a guest that I never thought I would have the opportunity to talk to. Today, we have Lisa Jaster. She is the third woman to graduate from the Army Rangers School. She is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu brown belt down in Texas. And she started training jiu-jitsu in 2013, went to the Armor Ranger School, Army Ranger School in 2015 when they opened it up to female officers. She was the third one to graduate. Um, and it's it's a great story. She has a book that just released that is called Delete the Adjective, A Soldier's Journey Through uh, Army Ranger School. I listened to it on Audible. I'll have a link down below if you guys want to listen to it. If you want to buy it also, there's going to be a link down below. Both of them will be affiliate links to Amazon if you want to support the podcast. It took me probably just a couple days. It's I think it's like a six, seven hour long book, audio book. But man, it is, it's, it's such a crazy story. She went to Army Ranger School as 35 years old and or 36 37 years old with two kids uh she was an art she's an army reservist um did seven years active duty and she's an engineer in the army she has a master's in civil engineering but her story is just i i think anyone will be captivated by it i think anyone will draw inspiration from her dedication and perseverance through so much adversity when it comes to army ranger school um, and then we don't necessarily talk a lot about her book in this conversation. We more talk about her views of jujitsu and how they parallel to military. Not so much military, though. And then we talk about like leadership, uh, her journey through jujitsu, being a woman in jujitsu. And just because we talk about, you know, her being a woman doesn't mean uh, guys won't be able to have something to gain from her because she there are men out there that are the same size as her she she mentions it a couple of times she's 5'4 140 pounds I know plenty of guys that are smaller than that so her views on training and training partners and how to find your game is great everyone can learn from it so uh, I think you guys should listen to her book it's 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 a really it's really really good and yeah go check her out on all the socials everything's going to be down below also don't forget, I should have said this first. Join the Facebook group, Elbros, over on Facebook. Link down below. Go to ElbowsTight.com if you guys want merch. Follow me everywhere, Elbows Tight. Give me a five-star review wherever you're listening to this. Respond to the, the, <laughs> the poll or the answer or the question down below on Spotify. Thank you guys so much. We are coming up on 100 episodes. But this is all about Lisa Jaster. Thank you guys so much. Uh, let me know what you guys think. Shoot me a DM over on Instagram. Uh, so a quick word from our sponsors, and then I give you Lisa. Thank you, guys. Peace. What's up, guys? Are you tired of grappling body hair on and off the mats? Well, have no fear, because we have a solution that will keep you rolling smoothly and in style, thanks to Manscaped. Picture this, you're about to step onto the jiu-jitsu mats, ready to dominate and submit all your opponents. But wait, what's that? your unruly body hair. <laughs> That's why you need Manscaped, the global leader in men's grooming. With their precision engineering tools, you could tame the hairiest situations and grapple yourself to victory. Imagine executing the perfect arm bar, all while knowing your ball hair is trying to sneak in a sneaky triangle choke. Thanks to the Lawnmower 4.0, you can easily eliminate that unwanted hair with this cutting edge technology. It's like a black belt for body hair. So to my fellow BJJ practitioners, whether you're a white belt or a black belt, let Manscaped be your secret weapon on and off the mats. Go to manscaped.com and use code ETP20 for 20% off and free shipping. That's ETP20 at manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping. And with Manscaped, you'll be a force to reckon with on the mats and in the mirror. All right. Welcome, everyone. I have a fantastic guest today. Uh, you, Lisa, you were actually brought up to me from uh, a friend, my buddy Mike, who is a former ranger. He's uh, he was he told me about you and sent me your profile on Instagram. And I was like, oh, man, I totally remember Lisa from the news when I was in the Navy watching all of this unfold. And like, here we are now because of jujitsu. I'm actually talking to you. And uh, I'm super grateful that you gave me your time today. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, and I really appreciate you having me on. This I'm looking forward to it. This will be fun. Yeah, have you done jujitsu podcast before, or is it just been like military or in leadership? I have, I have never done jujitsu podcast. I'm always talking about leadership and um, how to build a proper integrated team, and 
I never get to talk about the fun stuff, so I'm excited. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm glad we can we can have this conversation today and talk about uh, jujitsu. I was just telling a friend um, a while ago, or not a while ago, a little bit ago, about how you know having a podcast is super cool because you get to talk to people that you've never would have had the opportunity to talk to before, and all based uh, around jujitsu, a common goal. And I kind of gave it the analogy of like if I was like a a bigger industry, maybe like music or something like that, where it's harder to get in touch with people that have like a good following or a story to tell. Uh, it'd be much harder to do a podcast and get these people. But because jujitsu is like, we're such a still a relatively small community and tight knit and everyone, everyone that does jujitsu loves talking about jujitsu. It's such a yeah. great conversation starter. And then, you know, you just kind of like can dive in the weaves of who someone is just because of like their jujitsu game and stuff. You know, there's that. And then there's the fact that it doesn't matter if you're a world champion. Jits people will talk to Jits people. I I actually had an opportunity a couple of weeks ago to ask questions of a world champion and just as easy as, hey, do you think I should still compete? I'm 45 years old. I have arthritis. I'm, you know, I do this for fun three to five hours a week. And and to be able to ask the, the best people in the sport, it's like um, peewees being able to hang out with NFL players sometimes. Yeah. That's a great analogy, actually. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's so interesting, too, because people always talk about I get asked all the time, am I too old to start jujitsu? Am I too old to start jujitsu? You started jujitsu 10 years ago. Right. And you were how old were you? You, you were in Rangers 35, right? Yep, so I'm 35. what was it? What was the final deciding factor to to, to jump into jujitsu class finally? So my son was already doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu. My husband was doing it. And I would go to tournaments and say, go harder, uh, choke him, you know, sweep the leg. Like I had no idea what I was doing. And I actually thought to be a better mom, to be a better corner man, because sometimes the coaches can't get to all the little kids tournaments at a time. Uh, I probably should know something more than sweep the leg. Yeah, then I mean, the second you start, you kind of like get nipped by the bug. What was that? What was that first class initially like? You uh, you mentioned before we started recording, you were at Gracie Baja. What was it like stepping into the 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 dojo for the first time? Already a athlete, so I'd already been doing CrossFit for quite some time, and I'd been watching my son specifically train. So I had a little bit of background, but when the professor started teaching the adults. And I was sitting there going, okay, this is stomp the cockroach or skateboard or any of the terminology that Professor Umpiano used with the children. That was the only thing that was in my head. So I think that first class was more, okay, this is an adult class. This isn't me just learning how to teach kids. This is me actually learning the sport. What was the, what was the, the first big initial like victory that you had in, in your jujitsu journey? I think it's the first time you submit somebody. And um, anytime I meet somebody and it's their, their first class or the first couple weeks, and you can even ask my professor now, I say the exact same thing. Give it six months until the next new batch of people come in. It's school let out and the summer session starts or the New Year's resolution guys. If you can stick with it until January when the new guys come in and you sweep or submit somebody for the very first time, not because they let you or not because you were drilling, but because you actually know more than them, you're like, damn, because you train every day with the same bubbas and they know your tricks and you know their tricks and they know the counters to your tricks. So when that new guy walks in, um, it's it's really fun. So I think my first really great jujitsu moment was probably three to five months in when somebody came in and it was, was kind of a big dude. And he was like, Oh, Lisa, I don't want to hurt you. And it's, and professor just smiled at me and said, that's okay. You can, you can fight through the leash just a little bit. And I went and I did a sweep to submit and it was something simple like a Kimura. And, and it was like, Oh, the stars were aligned and the sun was shining. It's funny you mentioned six months because that's what I tell people too. Like the once you hit the six month mark, I don't know what what happens. Like you typically that first six months is you're just getting your butt kicked over and over again. And yeah, there's there's typically someone that comes in and you're like, 
I don't want to be that guy, but I kind of want to see how this is going to go. You know what I mean? And then, right. and then you're like, you're like, don't, don't worry. I remember, I remember like doing that the first time and I'm like, I'm like, just wait, man, six months, you're going to be good. It's like, you're going to have this feeling that I'm having right now of like joy and like knowing that, <laughs> uh, I would beat my six months ago self up that walked in the door. You know, it was like a, like, yeah. would I, would I kick my own ass back then? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And it's also the idea that you know, you look at someone and no matter what they look like, you don't know if they know how to fight. You know, getting punched in the face is one thing, but every fight out there goes to the ground. And I will tell you, my husband's in the Marine Corps. I'm in the Army. We've got two kids. There's been a lot of times where I'm by myself in a parking lot in downtown Houston with my kids and knowing that if somebody tries to attack me, I might not be able to beat them. I might not be able to get away, but I'm not a sitting duck. And I think that's what that first, after six months, you really realize when you're, when some things become natural, when somebody comes at you, you automatically drop your level and it's, it becomes, um, part of your nature to kind of be a little bit more protected, a little more based, a little bit more aware of your body. Yeah. The, the body awareness is such a fundamental aspect of the sport that I don't think a lot of people understand when they first start. And you mentioned this in your book, when you did your Ranger, uh, physical, you didn't know it was, if it was done right or not, because no one had ever done it before, or you had never done it before. Right. And I, it it made me laugh because I was thinking about like in the aspects of jujitsu, right. You don't know what a right submission feels like, or the, how the sweep is supposed to feel because you don't have that general understanding of what it's supposed to feel like or what it's supposed to look like. So you're kind of just like winging it. You're like, well, it worked. It's like, I don't know if it was right or not, but it worked. You know, it's like, is that still jujitsu? Yes. Yes. And I'm in a great situation now. The place I train at, the instructor used to be a uh, mixed martial arts fighter, but he's also he fought at a 140 pounds. So a lot of times you go into these dojos and it's these hulks of men, which they're amazing or they're really athletic or they've been training since they were six. And you come into the dojo and you're like, damn, like, I don't know what I'm doing and I can't do it. I can't do a flower sweep. I, I'm assuming a flower sweep on you from me would be pretty hard. All you have to do is lower your center of gravity. Well, then professor who's 140 pounds looks at me and goes, oh, just do it like this. And it's like reading from the dragon scroll and having somebody who can say, well, <laughs> the way Travis would do it isn't the way Lisa has to do it. So... Lisa, go ahead and angle yourself this way or, you know, and, and yeah, there is no right. So until you figure out what right looks like for you, you're sitting there going, oh man, like, am, am, am I headed towards success or am I about to get pinned? Yeah. Our, our school owner is a six foot five, 220 pound profe- or former MMA fighter, high level CrossFit athlete. And, um, he always mentions when he's doing technique, he's like, now, obviously I'm six, five. So this is going to look completely different for you than it does for me. So try to figure out what feels right for you. You might have to switch a grip here or there. You might have to, uh, you know, shrimp, shrimp out a little bit more for this or whatever. When you first started, did you have someone that was similar to you that you could kind of lean on and be like, hey, how do you do it? Like, maybe this will work for me. So we were just starting up a morning class. So it was very sparse. And finding somebody who's 140, five foot four as a training partner, or that's an experienced person coming to that class was damn near impossible. But um, I said my kids trained, my husband's six foot nine. So we would go in the evenings and while the kids were training, I'd actually look at what they were teaching the kids um, because I am. I am child size. Some, some people might say, uh, so I, I didn't, I didn't have that, uh, right away in the beginning, but I also did have a professor who was very well versed, been doing it since he was a kid, did it in the U S did it in Brazil, uh, who could, who could teach me some of those small techniques. But a lot of it was actually watching the kids and seeing, wait a second here, when somebody really big comes at you, they have all day worth of space. So I got to the point where I could recover guard on anyone because I could see the air between them and me when they were longer legged or longer bodied than me. How how long after you started jujitsu did you compete or have you competed? 
Yes. So I competed at uh, Blue Belt was the first time I competed. And like an idiot, it was my first competition ever. And I had never taken a no-gi class. And I signed up for both. And so if you sign up for uh, Blue Belt gi, you can't really sign up for novice no-gi. So I got yeah. caught in a standing guillotine in like the first three seconds. And I just refused to tap because my kids were watching. Um, I do not recommend that to anyone, but there is video proof. So I cannot <laughs> deny my stupidity. Uh, and then I competed a couple times at Purple Belt. I just got my brown belt uh, in December. It is really hard for me to compete, not because of me, but because of my dedication. Like most brown belts that are female in my weight class in their 40s, like we're, I'm extra super large masters or something like that when you're 45 years old. Uh, the few women that are still in my category own dojos or do this for a living or, oh. you know, fitness is their life. So I do find that I get my ass handed to me when I go to competitions at this stage. But maybe maybe there's going to be some point in my life where I'm not uh, working so much and I can train more. Uh, I think I'll try to compete at Brown Belt at least once just to to see where I stand. But I haven't. Even when I did my last competition as a purple belt, the, the women I was competing against were, were fantastic, first of all. But they were a weight class yeah. above and two age, age groups below. Oh, man. I just competed for the first time. Uh, I've talked about it pretty much every episode since I <laughs> since I did it, uh, but I'll talk about as it again should. because what you mentioned, uh, I competed first. Yeah, I competed for the first time as a blue belt, too, and I signed up. I only did gi uh, because I didn't want to stay there till 10 o'clock at night waiting for no gi to finish because it was I was like, I just want to go do it, get the gi done, get it out. Um, but it was it was a super interesting experience for me. I thought afterwards, I was like, man, I was so much better relative as a white belt than I am as a blue belt. I kind of wish I would have did it as a white belt now, just because yeah. I, I was more athletic. I had more time to train. I was way more dedicated. Now I'm a, I'm a father of three. Uh, I have a full-time job, you know, wife, yeah. all, you know, other hobbies. And so I competed on training two times a week yeah. and the guys I went up against, like compete regularly. Right. And they're, I mean, I'm only 33. So we're, I'm like masters one, so a lot of people still have really good gas tanks. They're still in like really good shape. And I was like, man, you guys got it. Like, good good for you. Like, go ahead. Right. <laughs> I just wanted the experience. Like, it was, it, it was, it was incredible. What was what, what did you think after your first time competing? Like, what was your mindset uh when you when you got done? I was I was so thankful, not only for the ability to compete, but again, one of my opponents was my age in B and my no gi appointment opponent was much younger than me everything about her was much better than me like i follow her on instagram she's even hotter than me like i just like i can't i can't compete with her in any realm um but i think the thing that came out of it some that was the best for me is we're friends now and jujitsu is crazy because you can have jujitsu friends who have face tattoos and grew up in a gang and you can be wrestling with or rolling with a DEA agent and then the lawyer comes in and then doc comes in in the evening and then you've got somebody who I, I rolled with a guy that what he does for a living is he lets companies test their drugs on him like I mean I have met so many awesome amazing people yeah I I would take too long of our time to explain that anymore but I have met so many amazing people and through the <laughs> Through the competition, specifically through, after that first competition, I have stayed in touch with both girls that I competed with on that very first Blue Belt competition eight years ago or seven years ago, however long ago it was. And we've stayed in touch. Our lives are completely different. I've been exposed to so much more. And it's, it's this weird concept of diversity in your friends through the community of jujitsu. And so I hope to always hold that. And one of the things I do is I'm in Virginia right now. There's two different dojos here in town that I drop into when I'm in town. But I, I roll with different people. We become friends on social media. I follow them. I discuss things with them. I listen to their opinions. It really broadens, it broadens my whole world to have 
new jujitsu friends. That's that's one thing that happened to me too when I competed is um I once I ended the competition, obviously I have a little bit of a platform, so I, I just wanted to like follow these guys and like I didn't tell anyone there that, you know, uh, I have a podcast, I'm doing this for like kind of like content and experience and whatnot and to help my audience. And afterwards, I was like trying to find everyone that I competed against because I just wanted to say, hey, thank you for, you know, it was a, it was a blast. I really appreciate it. Um, and it, what's funny is before we all started like getting on the map, we're all BSing. Everyone's like, look, dude, I got a 401k. I don't I don't really want to worry about like my knee breaking. So I'm going to tap early on if you guys lock in anything leg wise. And it, it was just it was nice because it kind of. When, when you see c- competition like on like flow grappling or like on YouTube, like it's always like the high level guys or yeah. whatever. So in my mind, I had this idea that like, oh, man, it's going to be straight killers. Everyone's going to be like stone face. Don't talk to me. Don't look at me. But it was the complete opposite. Like right. I was thrown off how nice everyone was because it, like I said, like I was like, dude, these guys don't want to talk to me. I'm about to roll against them. But it's right. just jujitsu, right? Like, yeah. it was, it's, so that was just like a big eye opener for me. It was just like incredible to have such like minded people that I was about yeah. to, you know, try to choke unconscious on a mat. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, my book's called Delete the Adjective. I hate talking about being a female in certain spaces, but there are very few women in the jujitsu world. So, you know, talking about finding those like minded people, finding, a mom with a couple of kids whose kids are on the mat, whose husband's standing mm-hmm. there. Uh, I, I competed against this, this woman last fall and she was, her situation was very similar, uh, except for her husband was there. And my husband has told me he hates watching me compete. It's worse than watching the kids. He's probably going to have a heart attack. He videos like the air or the <laughs> ceiling. Like he just, he can't possibly do it. He doesn't want to tell me to do anything. Cause he doesn't want me to fail. Other than the fact that her husband was there and my husband was like, send me a text when you're done. Um, our lives were so similar and there's no <laughs> other world than jujitsu that I wouldn't meet a woman like this. When I was signing up for the competition, my wife, my, so my, I have a 14 year old son and then I have a two and a half year old. He's going to be three in October. And then I have an 18 month old. And uh, so I have two pandemic babies and <laughs> it was, uh, she was like, Hey, do you want me to, to, <laughs> She's like, do you want me to bring the kids like and watch you? I mean, we can do that. It might be a little difficult. I was like, hey, look, I want you there. Believe me. But I don't want you there because I don't want you to see me get my butt kicked. And I don't <laughs> want my kids to have that memory of watching dad get their butt kicked. And then one day they're going to be like, do you want me to go grab so-and-so that choked you unconscious on the mat? You're like, what am I supposed to do? I can't have my kids have that leverage over me. Yes. Do you feel yeah. like like jujitsu? I know with my older my older son, uh, jujitsu has like really like strengthened our relationship because it's some it's adversity that we both go through together and learning. Do you feel like it's kind of made your family closer that everyone does jujitsu? Most definitely. Um, and it also pushes us apart. Uh, my son now is a high school wrestler, so he doesn't do jujitsu as much or really at all. Um, but he does wrestle. My daughter wrestles and does jujitsu, but they both do traditional sports as well, uh, school-based sports. And my son and I are a lot closer because when he's at a wrestling meet, if it's between my husband and I going, I'm always like, hey, listen, I really want to be there um, just because I feel that bond with you know, when he's playing football, hey, it's great. I'm going to video him. But when he's doing wrestling, I-, I feel it. And my husband does too, but he can connect with our son more during football season. With my daughter, I'd say it pushes us apart because I'm like, baby, you are five foot eight at 11 years old. Stop pulling guard. You're too big for that. You know, you need to tackle that little girl because she's 11 years old. So she's She's a monster in comparison to her opponents. And I said, don't pull guard, do spider guard, do open guard, like use those legs. And she's, mom, I know, shut up, leave me alone. So it might be putting a rift between my daughter and I. <laughs> so how, how do you fit in your jujitsu at home with, with all the extracurricular activities, your husband and you working and everything like that? How do you fit it into your schedule? Well, we have a couple knuckleheads that like to come in at like six in the morning uh, and So there's a beginner class at six and professor lets some of us others take over the other side of the the dojo or the academy and and kill each other in the morning. And I do believe free rolling 
and, you know, open mats is some of the best way to learn as long as you have good partners that are okay with, okay, stop, show me what you just did. Uh, so there are morning classes, but I also, I had to dojo shop or academy shop quite a lot uh, to find somebody that, uh, to find a school that was big enough to have opponents that were worthwhile, that weren't just trying to kill me. Cause as you mentioned, I got a 401k. Like I can't have broken wrists and then go give a speech in North Carolina. Like it just, it doesn't really fit with my, my mode. I'm in the army as well. I can't break my body and not be able to do the physical requirements that the military asked of me. So, you know, finding people that are willing to train with me at that level of, I want to go hard, but I don't want to get injured. And then also finding a place that had morning classes. And now we have morning classes, lunch classes, and evening classes. Um, and then also has sister schools. Oh man, that's nice. So that was, that was one of the great things about Gracie Baja, like them or hate them. But if you are a member of Gracie Baja West Chase in Houston, you can go to Gracie Baja in Norfolk, Virginia and uh, San Diego, California. So there is some benefit to that. Um, I'm not a Gracie Baja person, but I do have an instructor that will help me find places to drop in when I'm on the road as much as I am. You mentioned that uh, you're in the Army, right? If for people that don't know, you're the third woman to graduate Army Ranger School, which is an incredible feat. You have a book that you mentioned earlier, Delete the Adjective. I just got done with it. Uh, I binged it this week because uh, I knew that we were going to be talking, so I wanted to make sure that I had a little bit more information on you. Um, uh, one thing that you talk about in the book quite a lot is like the difference in standards from mm -hmm. uh, you know different instructors and different people that are just teaching you and from person to person. And not so much, uh, this question is not so much about the army side of it, but like the jujitsu side, it sounded like it kind of bothered you in, in ranger school. Does it ever get to you that we don't have like standard, like standards for each belt? It's like very subjective, uh, based on the person or anything like that. Do you ever have that, that, uh, feelings towards that? I do actually, um, only because I, I feel bad for some, some competitors and so every school that I've paid to be part of, now I've done a lot of drop-ins. I, when I first moved uh, out of Houston, I spent three months doing one week tests at various schools. So I went to 12 different schools those first three months, trying them out and trying to figure out what, how are we teaching? What is this? Does this professor have a theme? Like, are we going to work on guard all week and we're going to work on side control all next week? Or are they just going to wake up in the morning and have some random thought process of, I watched this on uh, flow and now I want to show you this cool move that I, I saw on YouTube or whatever. And um, so it does bother me only because there's people out there that are getting cheated out of the experience. My professor won't promote somebody unless he sees them. And at one point in time, when I got my brown belt, I teared up. I teared up. I had been a purple belt through I had two shoulder surgeries. I had a deployment. I've been a purple belt for a really long time. And when professor gave me the brown belt, I'm, I looked at him and tears in my eyes, which is so not something you should do with all your jits buddies around, but tears in my eyes. And, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't deserve this professor. And he cursed at me and he was like, don't you dare think I would give you this shit if you didn't earn it. So one of our favorite things to tell the kids is the belt doesn't fight, the person does. And and I really feel like I've earned every stripe I've received. And and so I think I think people are that's that's stolen from people when they go to a school where it's just the instructor saying, "All right, this is something cool I saw online. This is something, hey, I really wanted to try this." And and so I, I do, I don't think the sport should be regulated, but I do think that's a benefit of competing and then also doing, and if you don't compete, doing drop-ins to other schools. I'm a huge proponent of that. It's really amazing when you go up against another school or an, uh, a practitioner from another school and you're like, oh my God, I've got no response to this attack or man, maybe professor actually knows what he's talking about. Yeah, it was a, it was a great feeling after competing Cause it felt like I like, I was like, all right, I did pretty good besides like losing two matches. Like it wasn't like super bad losses and it was more of like a gas tank kind of loss right. uh, for the second one or first one. But yeah, it was a good, it was like, it was a big confident booster 
rolling against these guys and I was like holding my own. You know, I won my first match, lost my last two, but um, like I felt good afterwards because I felt like I was like, oh, man, they didn't hit me with anything I didn't know. Right. There was there was no real surprises there uh, besides like my own my own gas tank. And it was a, it was a super cool experience. And like you mentioned, it kind of sucks because not everyone gets that, you know, right. not everyone like there are belt factories out there. People are watering down jujitsu, um, you know, unfortunately, um, in, in your conversation with with. Uh, Tim Kennedy, which must have been super cool to sit down and talk with him on the About Violence podcast. That was a great, great interview. Uh, one thing that he talked about that you you agreed with him was uh, the military being mean without being mean. Like it's necessary because it builds character. And I I instantly, once again, thought of like jujitsu. Do you feel like jujitsu should be kind of like held the same way? Like there, you have to be kind of assertive and mean in jujitsu to like fully unlock the potential of some some techniques and some some uh potential i guess you could say it definitely definitely um one of my favorite things is when i was a young white belt and i knew i was stronger than people uh than quite a few of the ladies because i had been lifting and training um various styles of martial arts for for decades by that time and it was i still had to be told hey lisa smash like you, if you don't put pressure, if you don't cross face, if you don't put your weight right, then the other, then your opponent can't train either. So it is important that you're just a little bit mean while being nice. Kind of a funny sidebar though. Uh, I saw one of my training partners at HEB, which is a, a popular chain in Texas grocery store. And he came up and he hugged me and I was like, dude, what are you doing? And he's like, we literally sweat on each other. <laughs> like six days a week and you're uncomfortable when I hug you in the milk aisle at the grocery store. And I'm like, yeah, kind of. Cause it's a different type of hug, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's a weird relationship that uh, jujitsu people have. My, my buddy on Instagram, part-time jujitsu, he, he just literally just made a reel about this and he kind of pokes fun at like on the mats, like we're, we're all so close. But then when we get off the mats and we see each other in public, it's kind of like, Hey man, hey, you're trying bro. not to talk about jujitsu. Like how, how, how is everything? It's like, yeah. like, it's like, we're great friends. Like I know a lot about you because jujitsu tells a lot about you, but it's like in public, it's like, don't talk about jujitsu. Don't talk about jujitsu. <laughs> what else do we talk about? How's, how's the job and kids? It's like, yeah. it's like so socially awkward. It's like, <laughs> but it's, it's nice going to, I don't know if your Academy does this, but our, our Academy will do it every once in a while. They'll have like potlucks or, you know, they'll have like USC events or anything like that. Does your, does your Academy do that to kind of help build that camaraderie a little bit stronger within the Academy? My current one does not. Uh, and I, I drive over 45 minutes to go to this specific school, but our place in Houston, you know, we went through hurricane Harvey together um, we've had various members um, pass away. So the school in Houston that I belong to, we did food drives and we did all of those activities. Mm -hmm. We had Halloween parties. So you came and did jits in your Halloween costume. So that that community building is huge. Maybe I should recommend that at my current school. I'm not sure what the professor would say to me. I mean, you could just like post up a projector on the mats and make sure that they're nice and clean and just like watch a UFC. Like we've done that before. Oh, that's um, cool. it, it was a, a, yeah, a lot of fun. Were you a blue belt when you went to ranger school? Like how, in, how far into your jujitsu journey did you get to ranger school? Yeah, I was a blue belt when I went to ranger school, which I definitely appreciated. We had, the instructors had actually asked, um, made a couple comments about moving through the woods and doing certain activities when, you know, we weren't talking hand to hand combat very often. There's a small piece in there, but it's, it's not a major point of the school because it's a tactics and leadership school. Mm. But uh, one of the ranger instructors asked a question and I said, Oh, it's like doing a shot. He goes, you know what a shot is? And I just stood up and I'm tired and I stink and I'm way skinnier than I'd ever been before. And I just did a quick wrestling shot. And he's like, okay, this is cool. And I got automatic street cred, but that's a long answer to say, yeah, I was a blue belt at the time. <laughs> Do you feel like, uh, obviously that's one scenario. Has there, were there any other scenarios in, in uh, ranger school where you felt like your jujitsu kind of uh, benefited you? Listen, if you can go through a 
five minutes of some 260 pound dude. And I'm just talking about rolling with my husband when we both took the same class together. Nothing PG, I promise. But if you can put up with (laughs) 260 pounds and his side control for five minutes, you can walk up a mountain. You can run another mile. Like there is a level of suffering in jujitsu and I see it in wrestling. I see it in, um, all of the, the grappling combatants, there is a level of suck that is really teaches you how to suffer. And people like to call it resiliency or whatever you want to call it. But the reason why my kids do grappling sports is there is nothing worse than having my husband's side control. You just, just it's a terrible place to be. And if he gets that, if you can survive that, you can survive a lot of things at Ranger School. And there are things that I actually went through. There are there were days where I was like, okay, I've I've been in worse positions than this. Yeah, it's it's uh, my son. He plays. This was his. He was an eighth grader and played middle school football for the first time this year. Never thought in a million years I would ever see him pad up. And so it's an s- incredible experience to watch him play football on the field. Like I was like beyond proud of him, right? Because he stepped out of his comfort zone. He does not like contact. He's a jujitsu guy. Um, and even when he was like on the jujitsu mats when he first started, he was like really awkward like then like people yeah. touching him getting in his space i was like man well this is gonna break that real quick and so now you know now he's like i want to roll hard with people uh i want to you know tap people and whatnot but when they gave him a compliment in his football abilities they're like they're like hey like you are a natural athlete like you have great body awareness and mm-hmm. and uh you know you have like some of the some of the stances that we do in jiu-jitsu kind of translated over to his football stances and they're like Charles, you're doing great, man. And it, it, it was awesome as a parent because that helped build his confidence in something he's never done before. You yeah. know, it's like the transferable skills and athleticism that he's been doing since he was, you know, 10 years old. He's like, jujitsu helped me out. I was like, yeah, yeah, dude. I was like, it's it's great. Now you know you can go for like a uchimata on a guy in the on the field or like <laughs> throw these guys or something like that. He's like, is that legal? I was like, I have no idea. I never played football, <laughs> but if you get a penalty for it, at least it was cool. <laughs> yes. Well, I saw. Did, I saw. Did, one has of it our... helped your your kids' uh, confidence too? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, well, I, my son also plays football. He's going to be a sophomore this year. Um, definitely a really hard tackler for somebody who he's only fourteen still. Um, but man, he hits hard. It was kind of funny because we were watching a game and I saw him ankle pick somebody. And I'm like, hmm, not sure if that's legal on the football field, but no, nobody said anything. <laughs> so we're good. You're like, do it until they say stop. Like the, once you get the penalty, then that's the best way. To know. I mean, there's so many arbitrary rules in football you don't even know about until you're like, I didn't even know that was a penalty. You're like, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah it's, that, it's, it's a penalty. It's like, that's what I try to tell him all the time. Like he asked me questions about positions and stuff. I'm like, dude. I don't know. You should probably ask your coach because yeah. otherwise you're going to, I'm going to probably give you the wrong answer. I just watch football. So, um, well, but, and funny story. So too, what though, was it you mentioned in, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, no, with my daughter, she plays bas- basketball and volleyball and basketball gets surprisingly violent. Um, especially as the girls are hitting their preteen stage. And she, I remember her walking off the court one day and she's like, well, I can take that girl. And, and so you say confidence and, and yeah, it definitely gives them confidence in other sports. Yeah. With the, the women's side of jujitsu, we talked about a little bit earlier how there's not a lot of, you know, visibility of the women's side of jujitsu, which is so crazy to me because every time you watch like uh, EBI or like Medusa, Medusa is one of the coolest events now because, you know, it's an all women jujitsu competition and those women out there are getting after it man if you guys at home have never watched a medusa event it's it is incredible how good these women are and uh not not downplaying because they're a woman you know adjective or whatever but like just as practitioners they're just incredible you know and a lot of the times we hear um from female competitors especially high level ones that there's not enough opportunity in competing for women based on weight classes uh you know they don't have absolutes you know they have I think it's a 165 pounds and open. You know what I mean? So you could be right. like 165 pounds going against a lady that's 250 pounds. Like that's a huge weight discrepancy. What would you like to see in jujitsu competition for women that uh, to make it better and attract more people to to come and do jujitsu? 
That's a really hard question because I would love to see more women do it, but I don't think it's for the sake of competition. I think I think what women aren't understanding is the confidence that we've already discussed and the self defense aspect of it um, for for women who who know what the the non protected world looks like. And there's a lot more women out there than than admit to it that have been in in scuffles, shall we say? Like jujitsu is extremely practical. I was actually just talking to a former boss of mine this morning, she's like, hey, I want to get my daughter into a combat sport. What should I do? Jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu is self-defense. Jiu-jitsu is huge. So I would love to see more women getting into it and it being the women who are already in it, but also the men who are there. Stop just bringing your son. Bring bring your daughters as well, because that that girl is going to go to college someday and daddy's not going to be there with a shotgun behind the front door waiting for boyfriend to be a butthead. So um, I don't know what we can do at the competitive level. I think it is hard to compete when you're a recreational athlete as a female because our the demographic is so small. There's so few women already doing it that you have the pros that do it three hours a day versus people like me who do it three hours a week. So I think it is hard to, to try to manage the competition level, but in the academy level, we have got to start pushing for young women to get in there. It's fitness, it's mental health, it's community building, and it's self-defense, which I think is so critical for, for our next generations coming up. As a brown belt, when you see these like self-defense ladies on, on Instagram or on YouTube and they're, they're doing these like BS things, you're like, that's, a, a, that's not going to work. A phone to the throat is not going to stop someone. They're just going to slap it out of your hand. Like, do you ever get frustrated seeing seeing these things? I do love now that social media is so prevalent because by the time I start looking through the comments, there's 50 people who have already been uh, saying how false these things really are. I, I, I need people to understand, stop watching Hollywood. There is no seven punch routines. The only people that stay standing up when they fight are people who are boxing or Muay Thai. It real fights go to the ground, period. Nothing more to say. If you want to learn how to fight, you've got to learn how to defend from your back, period. Yeah, and in, in your book, once again, you mentioned that when you would sleep at night, at first they, were, they had you separated from the other rangers in the academy. You had to go sleep in a whole different part of the, the wherever you guys were unless you're out, actually out in the field. And a, a, a fantastic part that you brought up was, and I didn't even think about it either, was your safety factor, right? It only takes right. one or two guys to, like you mentioned, have an have idea in their head and you're away from everyone else. Um, what, what was that like when you broke it down to, you know, your the ranger instructors that, you know, like, hey, this is a legitimate concern of mine. I don't think you guys fully understand. Like, what was that whole going through your head during that? You know, it's really hard for me because I like being one of the guys. I like being in the field, but no matter what, no matter how tough I think I am, I am still in a different category. I still have my adjectives. Those can't be ignored. And it was hard for me to approach the issue because First of all, I had to identify that, yes, I am this outlier. And yes, I have something that distinguishes me and puts me in a weakened position versus my peers, which so that was hard for me. But I think it was really good for the instructors as well, because they got to realize that, yes, I'm one of my one of the guys. But I understand that being a female in the barracks with 60 some odd dudes is a different, I'm still different. And, and I think part of delete the adjective, when you talk about the work, the book, you know, we talk about merit, we talk about capabilities, but just because I don't want the adjective defining me as a individual contributor, I don't forget that I'm a woman. I don't forget that I'm smaller than you. I don't forget that when I walk to my car at the end of the day today, I am more of a target than if you were walking to the car at the end of the day today. And so, you know, really understanding that there is the delete the adjective side, but there's also the realistic side. All men were not created equal and men and women definitely um, aren't equal. We are built differently. I talked to one of my buddies when he came on the podcast and he had lost uh, 150 pounds when he started jujitsu. 
and he found out that he was extremely flexible in his weight loss. And uh, he was surprised, like everyone was surprised that, you know, as a former big guy that he was he was able to move the way he did. Since starting jiu-jitsu, have you found any advantages uh, that you weren't expecting to have when doing jiu-jitsu? Well, my flexibility definitely hasn't increased. Um, nothing to do with jujitsu, but I've had two shoulder surgeries and in college I had a hip surgery. So flexibility and mobility, I probably um, am maintaining because somebody's always trying to stretch my arms for me. Uh, I probably would be a lot worse off without jujitsu. Um, I think probably the advantage that I've, I've discovered is there is, there is some benefits to being a smaller person. Um, you can definitely exploit gaps in, Mm. in people's physical game. Like if there's, if there's an opening, I'm going to get an arm or a leg in there, get a shoulder underneath. Um, I'm going to recover guard no matter what. Uh, I am a guard player. I know I shouldn't admit to that. Uh, (laughs) I've tried to not be, but yeah, I just, I can't. Um, I think the, the other things that I found out about myself is really the, like the CrossFit type world and those multifunctional movements that uh, I've incorporated into my workouts over the, as I've gotten older, sandbags, heavy balls, uh, the, the concrete Mason, um, you know, those 150 pound balls, the, just the weird exercises, heavy carries have become uh, super integral in my training, but they've also shown to be great rope climbs that's great for grabbing somebody's gi and wrapping it around their head it, there's a few things that um i've discovered through jujitsu wh- that i was doing right there's plenty of things i've discovered that i was doing wrong but a lot of those mobility stability strength and stability not just doing an overhead press but walking with a dumbbell overhead was something i did because of the military and it it translates very directly to jujitsu when I when I first started jujitsu, I was a heavy CrossFitter. We were attached to our CrossFit gym, okay. and our academy owner is uh, our CrossFit gym owner. Also, he, he's a he was a, a purple belt when we opened it up, and you know I I, I don't know if it was the uh, same with you, but when I first started, I was in great shape, right? And I had an engine for CrossFit, but then once I started jujitsu, that meant absolutely nothing. I was nice. like. It was a completely different world, and I was like astonished about how out of shape I was. I'm obviously sports specific, but I, I was like, no, my my athleticism over there doesn't necessarily play over here. My strength over there doesn't necessarily play over here. I was getting dominated by like an 18, 19 year old one stripe white belt. You know what I mean? I was just <laughs> yeah. getting my butt kicked. Was that similar for you when you first started? Well, so I've actually developed my grip strength excessively because that way I can just hold some of these bigger guys until they're tired and that's my that's my technique since i can't i can't figure out how to get the right kind of cardio for jujitsu i just wait till the other guy's tired i just hold them in place you're like look you're not going anywhere i'm not going anywhere you're gonna have to like shrug me off a little bit (laughs) yes exactly (laughs) yeah so uh one question that we we always like to ask people when they come on the show since we are I, I do try to cater this more towards beginning practitioners um if if you could give a brand new white belt day one uh advice what would it be you know we talked about it earlier stick with it at least six months before you decide if you love it or hate it um because you'll you'll find you love it and the other thing is don't go hard all the time you know there are days when you need to go hard because those days help you discover the flaws in your game but as a white belt, all you've got is flaws. So um, take your time, roll easy. Don't don't roll like a cat in a wet paper sack, which is what you'll see the white belts doing. And and the white belts hurt often hurt the upper belts, and then the upper belts don't want to roll with you. They don't want to train with you, which means you're you're missing a huge opportunity to learn some really neat techniques. Um, specifically with me as a 140 pound female. If I get one of these guys that comes in, uh, and we get a lot of big guys because the law enforcement in San Antonio, a lot of them come to our, our dojo, and you'll get these big, tough guys, and they just want to dominate, and God forbid they get tapped by someone my size, especially a woman, and it's like there are so many opportunities to learn if you don't just try to crush the hell out of me. 
um, yeah. So, so don't go hard all the time and, uh, and take a breath. It'll, it'll take about six months and then you'll, you'll really start to enjoy the roles. Yeah, I completely agree. That was one of our mistakes when we first started jujitsu is I feel like we, we kind of went too hard too often. Mm -hmm. Um, and we were me, me and my old co-host, John, uh, he's 45. He started when he was 38, 39. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we were like super like all the time trying to get our blue belts super focused on it. We went to Japan and we trained probably five, six days a week. You know, it was like as much as possible. And I, I, I'm, I'm pretty open about this. And I think that was detrimental, obviously, or um, to my jujitsu journey. Because once I got my blue belt, I was like, cool. I'm going to be here for a while. Like, yeah. now what do I do? You know what I mean? And I kind of oh, like... Yeah. I, I kind of like fell out of love with it for a little bit. I kind of got blue belt blues very quickly yeah. at the beginning of my blue belt because I was just like, I worked so hard for it. And then it was, you know, it was, it was amazing to accomplish it, but it, there was that the second I got tied to my way. So the next class I went to, I'm like, dude, I'm gonna be here for years. Yep. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> this is my longest belt. Like, why did I push so hard to get here so fast? Um, have you ever gone through your, your ebbs and flows with your jujitsu journey? Definitely. And, and so my journey has been stunted by a couple of things. Uh, two shoulder surgeries I mentioned. Uh, I also deployed to Iraq uh, in 2018, and that took me out for a little bit. Uh, thank God there were some, some people downrange who were willing to roll with me. But it was, it was very, uh, it was more fight club than jujitsu training on most days. Um, I think I think I get nervous because I don't want to be the next belt because I am constantly rolling with people who are younger and bigger than me. And I'm, I'm scared that I don't deserve it. And, and I get really stuck and really frustrated because when I do get better, I find that my training partners will, if they're not getting better at the same pace, I, I will go through weeks where I am at home and I could train five, six days a week. Sometimes I'll do back to back classes and then I won't be able to train for a while. But while that I'm really, really focused, I am getting better. I am uh, learning new techniques. And my bigger, stronger, faster, younger training partners will get frustrated with me. And then they'll they'll want to just hold me in place. Or I'll take some time off and I come back and it's like, oh, I'm a brown belt. I should know this. But, it, you know, if you're not doing it every day, it's not natural to to dig your hand under or to dive into a certain location. It's just, it's not natural to answer the phone. And so you need to, you need to train regularly. But yeah, so, so to answer the question to make a short story long, which is what I always seem to do, uh, <laughs> is yes, I definitely get depressed and my training partners will sometimes be like, hey, Lisa, like, stop the pity party. Like, we're, we all go through these ebbs and flows, but it's still, it's, I think it's always hard and that's why it's fun. Um, because I, I do enjoy the fact that jujitsu is something I'm not great at. Uh, it's a challenge daily. Somebody's always better than you. Yes, yeah, very, very humbling. So how do you approach your classes when you do get to train consistently or when you are sporadic in your training? How do you approach your class? Because I always talk about, uh, you know, as someone that trains maybe twice a week, maybe three times a week, I've, I've really developed a, uh, a habit of, being intentional with my classes. Like yeah. I have to know when I go in there, I have I'm, uh, today I am working on this. I want to work on this. I want to get this position, you know, because I don't, I don't have the opportunity to train as much as like you mentioned your counterparts. So I just try to put myself in bad positions or work on something that is gonna, you know, benefit me the most or watch something at home that I'm trying mm -hmm. to work on. Also, how do you approach uh, this sporadic nature sometimes when you have busy lives and you can't train as often as you want to. Yeah. I think setting a goal is fantastic. And I will walk up and you know how everybody starts on their knees. I never start on my knees. I never <laughs> do. Unless my partner says, Hey, can we start on our knees? I start standing every time. Um, so mm. takedowns is a weakness of mine. Um, again, getting below somebody's center of gravity is easy for me, but to actually get, uh, be stronger than them in the process. So, um, Lately, I have said, okay, I'm, I'm a brown belt. I've got to start working leg lock defenses because I've never done it. I've got hyper flexible ankles. I have no lower body injuries. So I'll give people my legs knowing that I don't want them grabbing my arms. 
And then I can, I've got the grip strength and I've got the cardio that I can hold them. So lately I've been saying, all right, I've got to work uh, leg defenses and I've got to work takedowns. And I always, before the slap pop, I will look at my partner and say, what injuries do you have? And I use that as a tool for me to train. If it's their right shoulder that hurts, I train weak side that day. I'll only attack their left shoulder. And that'll be what I try to keep in my mind. But I try to have a goal for each role. I'm going to work top game. I'm going to work. I always work half guard. Like I went from being a guard player to say, oh, I'm not a guard player anymore. I'm going to work half guard. So then I just get stuck in half guard and locked down probably 75% of my roles. Um, but yeah, so I, I definitely go in with a very specific goal. If, you're, if your knees hurt, then I'm going to try to play top so that you don't have to hurt your knees more by playing uh, your top game. You, you mentioned in there, you know, being a good training partner. Uh, and I definitely think one way to be a good training partner and have good training partners is your leadership within the academy, right? If you have a, a good professor, black belt, brown belt, whatever, teaching you, I definitely think that that uh, mindset of, you know, trying to have goals, trying to be protective of your training partners it comes a lot more natural, right? There are definitely people out there that are have toxic instructors and toxic environments. Like I've dropped in at a couple places where I'm like, man, you guys are like, D bags in here. Like it is yes. completely unnecessary. As someone that is like so, you know, you're you're uh an army officer, you teach leadership to executives, you know, leadership is your thing. What do you what do you think makes a good jujitsu academy instructor or professor or owner? You know what I mean? Like a leadership position within the academy. I think one of them is they have to be somewhat of a businessman. And I'm not talking about the belt belt factory businessman. I'm talking about the, you know me, I'm in there 10 hours a week, let's say. Let, let's let say it's one of the weeks where I can do back-to-back -back classes five days a week and I'm there almost 10 hours a week. And then I can drive and my kids go to go there too and I drive 45 minutes to go to that school. Well, I want you to remember my husband's name. I want you to remember that I just flew back from wherever. And Part of it's business, but part of it is knowing me as the human, knowing me as, hey, when Lisa doesn't show up for three weeks of training, is she sick or was she in Virginia for her annual military training? I want my professor to know that because I want him to know me as a person and protect me as a person. Now, when you have a big school, you can't do that for everyone, especially kids classes. You know, you might have 20 little screamers running around the room, but your people that are showing up on a regular basis, your people that have been there a year or two, like get to know them. And I think that's really the best way to be a leader because then it becomes, you were talking about it earlier, you know, watch UFC together, have, have a Halloween party, become yeah. part of each other's lives because then, then I've got friends with face tattoos and PhDs and we're all hanging out together. Sometimes they're the same person too. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you don't have those awkward conversations in Safeway when you see your jujitsu buddy. You're like, don't "Hey, me, bud, man. how's it going?" <laughs> hey, Lisa. Well, I uh, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. This was a blast conversation. Uh, if you guys don't know, like Lisa mentioned, she just read a, uh, wrote a book. It's out now. I listened to it on uh, Audible. I'm gonna have a link down if you want to buy it on Amazon or listen on Audible. What else? Uh, if people want to find you or get in touch with you or watch your journey and everything like that, where can people find you at? For the fun stuff, I post on Instagram. Um, I, it's just Lisa A. Jaster, all one word. Um, for more business stuff, for leadership, I'm a huge fan of LinkedIn, but I do keep those lives separate. You will see on my Instagram me and my kids working out uh, and you'll see in LinkedIn me doing my business stuff, but I'm on all the socials. I, I love social media and I always read the comments. So if you decide to reach out to me via Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, yes, I have a Snapchat and a, uh, what is this one? The TikTok. Uh, the TikTok, and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was supposed to be flossing. That's the 45 year old version of flossing. <laughs> I'm 33 and I still can't do it. My, my, my son's pretty good at it. My older said, I'm like, I, bro, I'm, I'm terrible at it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But yeah, so um, LinkedIn for professional stuff. Instagram for you'll see my my days with my mouth guard and my jujitsu hair don't care type posts. Well, thank you, Lisa, so much. Uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed the book. It was a phenomenal story. Great story about pushing through all kinds of 
you know, physical adversity, other people adversity, mental adversity. It was incredible book to read. So uh, thank you so much once again for coming on the show today. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening and watching at home, and we'll catch you later. Remember, the whole check's here. Peace. Thanks, Travis. <laughs>